So this morning, we're going to kind of finish up this series called Home for the Harvest. We believe we're at the beginning, the precipice of a revival, of a move of God. Uh, this morning, I will share shortly. I will not share long. Um, my friend Cody is going to share with me this morning. I was going to share his testimony for him. And Homeboy starts talking about these stories of people getting healed at the gym and radically saved. And I'm like, I will not do these stories justice. So you need to share about this. And we're just going to release hope and faith in the house. And if you were dragged here this morning and you were brought by a family member, I'm so glad you're here. Not today. There it is. We're glad you were dragged here this morning. You will be uncomfortable, I promise you. But God's spirit will show up. So turn with me in your Bibles to two passages. Acts chapter 2, verse 46 and 47. This has been our anchor verse for the series. Acts 2, 46 and 47. And then Luke chapter 10, verse 2. It says this in Acts 2. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. Praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number. Say, day by day, day, by day. he added to their number those who were being saved. Luke, good job. Thank you very much. <laughs> Should have been clearer. I got to work at the speaking thing. Luke chapter 10, verse 2. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we are grateful. We're so grateful. I'm so blessed by every one of those lives that were dedicated to you today. Lord, they've said prayers. They've had moments of breakthrough. They said, you know what? I'm going to follow you as a disciple. But today they made a public declaration that Jesus is king, that he is Lord of their life. And we ask this morning for all that are here that are unsure. They don't know why they're here this morning. Something compelled them. We say, Holy Spirit, get a hold of them. Show them. God, we thank you today. The sick will be healed. Those that have been bound in addiction will be set free. The oppression of the enemy must be broken. We just declare this morning, the yoke of the oppressor will be broken today. God, we pray for your manifest presence. We pray for signs and wonders and miracles. Holy Spirit, stir in this house a fresh move of your spirit. God, I bless my brother Cody. I thank you for the testimony of his life. Though he's young in you, he's mature in spirit. And I'm grateful for the fire that will be lit today. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, get ready. Amen. Get ready. It was 1976, and a young farmer named Angus and his wife, Jill, were having this massive issue in Zambia. And as they're in Zambia, there's this civil war that breaks out, and they had a 3,000-acre cattle and corn farm. So abruptly, they have to leave with just the clothes on their back. They run to South Africa with their two small children. With what little money they had, they begin to build this small little house. They lived in a trailer. Now, Angus was a farmer, so he went around to the different tribesmen and the different Zulu tribes and started to do some work to raise enough money to buy a new farm. He then finds this gorgeous piece of land. As he finds this piece of land, he spends all he has only to find out that he was tricked and the land is barren. And as he, he begins to work this field and cultivate the soil, he's so discouraged. He's working seven days a week, 12 to 18 hours a day, trying to get this field prepared for harvest. After many seasons of unsuccessful crops, he's at the point of suicide. He's depressed. And his wife, Jill, says, I want you to come to my small little Methodist church. Now, here's the problem. Angus hated God, wanted nothing to do with God. He never saw God's blessing in his life. And he finally appeases his wife because she's going to leave him, to then go to this small little Methodist church. As he's there, this Scottish man begins to share about the power of Jesus. He's a guest speaker, and he calls them forward and says, you need to surrender your life to Jesus, because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. He says a voice compelled him. He gets out of his seat. He goes forward, gives his life to Jesus, and he's baptized in the Holy Spirit. As he comes back to his house, he begins to pray, and they feel like the Lord is telling them to plant a potato farm. Here's the problem. They're in the middle of a drought, and no one has successfully planted potato crops in that area. So as he's there, they spend all the money they have. They pray over the farm, and in the midst of drought, they produce one of the greatest harvests that entire town had ever seen. As many come to buy these potatoes, he begins to tell them, this is his message, like, like potatoes, your faith needs to grow under the ground of your heart and it will change your life. You need to have faith like potatoes. What a strange gospel message. 
as he begins to share, he's going around and he begins to hire unemployed farmers because of the drought. And now they're working with him 12 to 18 hours a day as he preaches the gospel. Now, these men start to get saved. They begin to lead their families to Jesus, and they're seeing these breakouts of God's power in the Zulu tribes. Now, the Zulu tribes were steeped in witchcraft, and one day, he sees a man with mangled legs that's in great pain. He prays for him. That man gets, wa- gets up, walks, and is completely healed. Now, Angus has no theological training. Angus has never been on a missions trip in his life, but he's just doing what the book says to do. And as he does this, word begins to spread. Well, one night a tropical storm breaks out. As the tropical storm hits, he's in his house. He hears the screams of the Zulu women. He comes out and they have tarps over their head. And they're screaming and they're yelling at his fence. We need you. We need you, Brother Angus. One of our women has been struck by lightning. We need your medical help. So he grabs the medical supplies he has. He goes there to find her dead. As she's dead, he doesn't want to break it to them. It says, I'm so sorry, I need to take her to the nearest hospital. They said, no, you will not take her. They said, we've been hearing your stories about your God named Jesus. We want you to pray for her that she comes back to life. He said, I can't bring her back to life. They said, but your God can. So he gets there and he bends down. He grabs her hand and says, in the name of Jesus, we command life to enter to you. And he hears this voice say, pick her up. He grabs her hand. She pops back to life, raised from the dead. You're like, wait, hold up. The entire tribe gets saved. And he starts to go town to town leading healing crusades. And now in his late 70s, they've adopted over 26 children, led hundreds of thousands of Jesus, and led crusades as nearly 500,000 people for the healing power of Jesus Christ. Give him a shout. Come on. Luke chapter 10, verse 2 says this. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers, they're few. Therefore, pray that the Lord of the harvest sends out laborers into whose harvest? His harvest. See, we need to break the paradigm and the religious lie that you're unqualified and unfit to lead in God's kingdom. We have to understand that in Luke 10, when he calls these 70, other translations say 72. We can't get it right. We don't know why. But one of these numbers are standing before Jesus. And as they stand there, he says, all authority, I give it to you. Therefore, go house to house and proclaim the goodness of my kingdom. Declare the gospel of my kingdom and the sick will be healed. Here's what's unique about all those that he picks. They're unqualified, uneducated, and unsuccessful. Not one of them would ever make it through seminary. Not one of them would ever be qualified for the pastorate or for counseling. Not one. But he chooses fishermen, he chooses farmers, and he chooses thieves and says, I'm going to take those that no one picks, that no one sees as qualified because my spirit is that which brings you qualification. And he calls these men and they begin to go out. And as they report back in Luke 10, I love this phrase. He said, we went and we did and we prayed in your name and the sick were healed. And his response in joy as a good father says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven as you did these things. See, the same mission and the same call is on us as a church. Matthew 28 was not just for the disciples. It was for all of us. And what he says is this. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and preach the gospel and disciple the nations. That authority is now inside of us. What authority am I talking about? It's the same authority and dominion that Adam abdicated at the garden. And what Jesus does is he takes up the proper dominion, the proper authority, and literally regenesis his, his church and says, I want you to go out and walk in power, the same power I modeled to you. That's our responsibility today. And guess what? That commission has not yet been fulfilled. It has in part, but until he returns, that is our responsibility. And what he does is he calls this community. He calls this church. He calls what he, what he says is an ecclesia that we translate as church. See, he has to set up a new model, a new way, because the old way wasn't working. Luke chapter 5, he says this. No one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled. And the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. 
You see, Jesus knew a new model needed to be demonstrated. One of my friends, a pastor named Joe Sisak, said this. These little wineskins were not small. They were actually the entire skin of an animal. So you would literally take a calf. It was the entire skin. And these skins had to be new because the wine expands on the inside and will burst the skin. Let me tell you this, church. You need a new wineskin in your heart to contain the outpouring of God's spirit. Because the old wine skin, for the wine to expand, needs room to grow in his kingdom. And I love this, this phrase here. See, the wine skins that they would use were expensive. They were the whole part of the animal. See, the wine skin that God wants to produce in you, the wine skin of the heart, is costly and will require your sacrifice. It will call, require that which is precious to you. And he says, will you be ready? And the new wineskin he then models to them is that they need these homes, these houses ready. Because guess what? The people that they were calling to get saved were not allowed to enter the synagogue. They weren't allowed to go to the place they were meant to find Yahweh. They needed to create a new place. So what do we see as the model? In Matthew chapter 9, he goes out to Matthew the tax collector. He calls them and he goes back to his house. Many people misunderstand this because the way the King James translates it. It makes it look like they go to Matthew's house. Actually, they go to Peter's house, which is now Jesus' house because P Jesus has been kicked out of his. So Jesus is now at this house, and it says, as they gather here, many come that are sick, and tax collectors and sinners are gathered at the table. Church, we need communities and houses where sinners and those that are sick have a place at the table. I'm telling you this, I'm excited for this revival, but guess what? Those that are going to get saved may never walk into these four walls. And I'm fine with that. As long as the gospel is being preached and church is being established. I love my friendship. They led this, this couple, this family to the Lord that are now in their house. They've never been to this church. Ever. See, we need to start taking the church to them. We need to shift our mindset from meetings to mission. See, it's not about these meetings. I mean, God broke this paradigm in me quite some time ago. As I moved to this neighborhood, there was this gentleman that always you know, smoked cigarettes outside of his house, and his wife had injured her leg quite severely. So I saw her with this walking cane. I asked to pray for her, and I began to pray for her on a regular basis. Well, as he begins to share his story with me, it turns out he uh, was addicted to drugs and alcohol, and his kidneys failed. So his brother had given his life to Jesus and donated his kidneys to his brother. And so now he has his new kidney and he's recovering. He's on dialysis and we're praying through and I'm sharing with him about the love of Jesus. I'm praying for his wife. And one day I see him at the church. I said, what are you doing here? I said, well, my brother relapsed back into drugs and alcohol. I said, I'm going to do what you did for me. You need to come to my church. So he takes him to the church here. I meet his brother. And in my mind, I'm thinking, you've never even been here before. And you're calling it your church. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit showed me he's already been to church. Church came and visited him at his porch, the mission of God. And he felt included in a family he had never met before. Since then, he's given his life to Jesus. I've built a relationship with him for now three years. God is doing a work. We have to shift our focus from meetings to mission, church. It's time. And so what we see is that Peter and the apostles, they follow this pattern. And in Acts chapter 2, we see them start to gather in houses. Why is this profound? They're just doing what Jesus modeled to them. There's an outpouring of the Spirit. 3,000 are baptized, not commitment cards, not decision cards. They're baptized, surrendering their life, risking their jobs, risking their reputation. And now they're entering into homes. We need to get our houses ready, church, because the harvest is at hand. Hand. We have to get our houses ready. We have to open up our hearts. A couple weeks ago, I had this dream that I believe is the word of the Lord for our city. I shared it with my friend Adam Narciso, and uh, he said, we're going to pray that God opens this up. You need to share this word. Immediately the week after, I'm invited to Sam Rodriguez's church to preach on the harvest, and we share the dream. And in this dream, I'm approaching this giant house. And this house is huge, and I know it's filled with believers, but I know it's filled with believers from the Slavic community. I'm believing for a revival in the Slavic community. 
I know that's a risk. I know that's a declarative statement. I'd rather be wrong and risk it than no risk at all. But I believe there's going to be a powerful revival amongst the Slavic community in their houses that will help model the way to the modern church of Roseville and Sacramento on what revival looks like. So I'm praying actively for their pastors. So I, I go to this house. As I enter in the door, I notice that there's this giant feast. And it's filled with believers from the church. And there's this giant feast, this table that extends multiple rooms. As I look to the right, I see you know everything nice that you'd want to eat. But the front half of the table is reserved for produce. And it looks literally like someone just took baskets full and dumped it on this table. It's not like those Costco trays. You ever taste those terrible Costco fruit trays? They're awful. But you know, this is literally fresh fruit from the garden. And I hear a voice say, there was a harvest in this house. And when I hear the voice say this, immediately a man from the gym walks in that I've been praying for. And as he walks in, I think to myself, he's not saved. He doesn't belong here. And as I think this thought, another person welcomes him that also is not saved. And I hear the same voice that told me there was a harvest. It said, he is welcome here and he belongs here. I wake up from the dream, begin to pray. And I hear the Holy Spirit say, there's going to be a harvest in the house and it's time to get your house ready. And we have to understand those that Jesus is going to bring our way will not look like us, will not talk like us, will not sound like us. But the Spirit of God wants to inhabit those people and begin to see a powerful move of His Spirit take place through them. That's what we're believing for. See, we talked about the essentials of community. We talked about the DNA of community. And we said an Acts 2 community, which we're passionate about, and many of you have signed up for, but let me just say this. Community is not occasional. It is consistent. Community isn't at your convenience. It is critical. Everybody here needs to be a part of an Acts 2 community. Non-negotiable. I get it. You may have work schedules or softball or basketball, whatever it is. Then join an Acts 2 community online. Do something to be connected. So we've talked about the DNA of Acts 2, and Acts 2 is this. Acts 2 communities need to be spirit-led. The spirit of God needs to be present in them. Acts 2 communities need to be simple. Simple. Stop overcomplicating things. We all have dirty houses, and we know your house is dirty too. <laughs> Stop pretending like it's perfect. No, Chip and Joanna Gaines don't go to this place, okay? God bless you. God bless you. I was talking to my friend Natalie. I said, we just need to have a sign outside the door of this church that says, no perfect people allowed. You are not allowed to be here if your life isn't messy. All of us have messed up lives. So we got to understand that simple church, simple house is needed. Lastly, community is selfless. It requires sacrifice. It requires your generosity. It requires your schedule getting interrupted. I'm sorry. But letting people in your life I think Proverbs says it brilliantly. The, the messy barn is that which a lot, with a lot of cattle in it. And we need to be prepared to enter the mess. But there will be a miracle in the middle of that mess. I promise you that. So we talked about the DNA of Acts 2 community. But I want to talk today about three essential building materials for the house of harvest. You see, there's this project called the Nazareth Project. Here it is. And so what they do is they excavate first century homes in Nazareth. And they found that what's unique about the homes in Nazareth is they could withstand significant storms. The reason why they've lasted so long is because these homes were built on bedrock. Come on, you're going to capture this. They were built on bedrock. And when they would find a rock to build the house on, not a coincidence that Jesus is from Nazareth, right? As they build the house on, they had three time-tested materials. They would build it with timber from Jerusalem. They would build it with mortar and good old-fashioned dirt. And the way they fashioned these homes, that they were built on a rock, they could withstand storms. I'm believing that we are going to see a harvest, but we need to get our house ready for the harvest. And a house of harvest has three essentials that may not be practical for all of us here. It's going to require pursuing Jesus, but it's time to get our hearts ready for harvest. And there are three core elements that are needed to build this house. And the first element is this. A house of harvest needs to be a house of healing. We are believing for this house that our hearts, our homes, will be filled with the healing presence of Jesus that goes beyond the healing of physical bodies. Luke chapter 4 verse 38. After leaving the synagogue, he entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him about her. 
Then he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. Immediately she got up and began to serve them. As the sun was setting, all those who had any sickness were brought with various diseases to them, and they laid hands on them, and they were cured. See, rumor starts to spread that there's a man named Jesus, and it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your sickness. It doesn't matter your sin. The Spirit of God is present to heal, set free, and deliver you. This is the house we're called to have, a house of healing that is open for anyone to come. Now, this is what I want to challenge us to, church. We got to break the paradigm that it's professional ministry people that only can pray for the sick. All of you are equipped with the Spirit of God. Roman 8 says this, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. That's a big deal. And so when we see this, we need to raise the expectation of faith in this house. And here's one thing I want to break the paradigm of. We believe this, this, this lie that sickness comes from the Father. Or maybe that my road of sickness is part of my suffering journey. Stop it. See, Jesus came to break all those and heal all those who were oppressed by the devil. Now, I understand. I'm not one of those that says God won't use it. Yeah, he uses it. I get it. But he's not the author of it. He's not gifting sickness to his kids. It's not a good father. It's not a good father. We need to raise the expectation for healing. Now, if you're in the middle of a suffering battle, I get it. I'm still believing for healing in my body. I have lots of illnesses that have hit my body in the past several years. I'm believing for healing every day. Most of the time, I always joke with Brandon and, and Travis and Aaron. They keep giving words of knowledge that are me. I'm like, yeah, it's me. Stop giving my words of knowledge from the stage. We're believing for healing to break out, but we need to raise the expectation of faith. And so when you see somebody near you that needs healing or on the street corners, don't think, man, I wish I could take them to the local pastor. The spirit of God is in you. And here's the expectation. It goes back to when I first learned about healing. I met a man. God led me to the parking lot of Home Depot uh, or it was Expo. Not this one yet. Not this one yet. You guys are on it. Trust me. I love this. But he led me to this, this one parking lot. As I pray for this gentleman, I go there. Uh, he didn't get healed. And this is a longer story. I don't have time for it right now. He didn't get healed. And I heard the Holy Spirit. I was so mad at him. I said, why did you lead me to this? And he says, I have not called you the ministry of miracles. I've called you the ministry of obedience. Our ministry is obedience. You're not in charge of the outcome. We don't know what God is doing. We don't know what's on the other side of that healing. We don't know what's on the other side of that journey. When that guy got mad at me for trying to pray for them, I don't know if he stand, stood in front of the mirror that day and said, God, if you're real, send a sign. I don't know. But we, our responsibility is obedience. And right now we're starting to see an outpouring of God's spirit. Just a couple weeks ago, I was in Miami uh, for our leadership conference. And my friend Brandon flew out. And as we were there, we're walking on Miami Beach, and uh, Brandon's right knee starts to hurt. And he's like, man, my knee's acting up again. And I jokingly say, maybe it's a word of knowledge. We go to the bathroom to get our car, and a man approaches me and says, hey, do you have any money? I said, I'm so sorry, I do not. I said, but I'm a Christian. Is there anything I could pray for? And he said, you know what? I was actually hit by a car recently, and my right knee is killing me. I said, Brandon, you did get a word of knowledge. So we prayed for him, and this is Diel. This is what happened. Let's play that. Alright, well, tell me what just happened. I just got prayed. My knee just got prayed upon. Brandon? Yeah. And Brandon just prayed. And I've been limping all day. My fiance here is proof to that. My road rush right here yeah. proves my injury. And right now, your knee, how's it feeling? It feels better. Like I can walk. Oh, Jesus, bro. I was going to say I swear, but I ain't supposed to swear. <laughs> you good, bro? Alright, man. You good. Wow. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Man, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, ache like a workout pain, but not like. All right, we're just saying, Jesus I'm name, all pain leave. Jesus, all all ache go in Jesus name. All right, Jesus move it again. Look at this. Come on, man. Look, babe, I didn't put weight on it or nothing. Come on, dude. I got off the bus. I was like, ah. Every time I took hey, Jesus is faithful, bro. Come on, that's Diel. Here's what's so rad. He gets healed. He goes. You guys like televangelists? You got cards or anything? <laughs> I love it so much. Brandon then gets a word of knowledge for his fiance. He says, do you have right, right rib pain? And he's like, babe, it's the same thing. Yes, yeah, she got hit by the same car. So we have him, who's a believer. He shows us his Bible. He prays for her. Her rib goes back into alignment, completely healed. Right there, Miami Beach. We're starting to see healings happen. Here's a quick picture of people that have been recently healed. Just in this last week. Uh, do we have that, that slide of all the pictures? 
So on the right, there was one more here. We're at Mario Marilla. I ended up praying for this lady with five bulging discs in her back, emphysema in her lungs, and a ruptured cornea, all healed instantly. God completely restored it. You can look on Facebook. We have the video of that. We have another lady named Tracy who got healed of King Box disease. I don't even know what it is. She was radically healed. There's a young boy that's in our congregation who got healed of eczema. And this is Jessica, who, uh, whose eye got healed last week, and we're praying for and contending for her complete healing. God is doing healing in the house, church. And here's what we're believing for. We're believing for this, that this healing goes beyond just the physical body, but God heals families and he heals hearts. Last week, I want you to look online. There was a miraculous testimony that took place. We saw an entire family get restored. The McQueen family got restored after a long bout in prison with their father. God radically saved him and turned his heart over to Jesus, and the family was restored right in front of our eyes. I had never seen anything like this. And we're also seeing another family get restored. This is my buddy Cody as we're praying for his mom there with Mike Everson. God is doing healing in this house, and we're believing for an outbreak of his power. Now, I have two more materials that God wants to use to build the house. Uh, I warned the team of this because I need Cody to share his testimonies. I will be sharing live on Facebook this week those last two materials. So uh, watch on all of our social media channels. We'll have it uploaded to finish the rest of the message.